Our epistle lesson comes from Ephesians 6. During the summer months here, we've been reading through uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is kind of his uh, concluding word after presenting a lot of different things about how as Christians we should walk or live in faith. And here he's telling us how we should handle what's going to inevitably come to any Christian, and that's spiritual warfare. From this reading will come my message for this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in my opening of my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would
Having just sung that hymn by Luther brings to mind one of my favorite quotes from him. The Lord once spoke out of a horse's ass. May he continue to do so now. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon for this morning comes from Ephesians 6, especially verses 10 to 13. I've entitled it, You Don't Stand Alone. Well, one of my favorite genres of movies is westerns. One of my favorite actors in a western, and it might differ for you, my dad's favorite was uh, um, John Wayne. For me, Clint Eastwood. And one of my favorite Clint Eastwood movies is this one, Pale Rider. He's this kind of otherworldly, almost supernatural figure. The story kind of goes like this. It's the west, it's gold mining, there's this settlement, group of settlers, families, and innocent people that have come in and they're camped next to a stream outside of this town. They've gone through their due diligence and they've got the rights to mine in this particular area. But the town is owned by a mining company that's very strong and very rich and very powerful. And they don't want to share. They don't want to share this gold. And they're hell-bent to get these settlers out. They try to buy them out, the settlers refuse, so they hire a bunch of tough guys to put weight on them, to do things like harass them. And as the movie begins, you have these tough guys riding through camp and just destroying the whole thing. There's a little girl, and you see her praying, and she prays that the Lord would send them a savior. Now one of the younger guys, from this destroyed camp, he has to go into town to get supplies, and when he shows up, these tough guys that are hired by the mining company are waiting for him. They're waiting for him, and they each grab an axe handle, and they take him to task. They knock him down, he tries to crawl underneath the cart, and they pull him back out. One of them's got a match, and he's about to set fire to all these supplies that this guy has caught. When all of a sudden you see a hand holding a bucket of water, he throws it and puts the mash out and destroy and just totally soaks this bad guy. And of course, who is that? Our man Clint Eastwood. Clint walks over and grabs a remaining axe handle and uses that to take these four bad guys to task. Dispatching them, knocking them down, and knocking them out. Till the final bad guy is on the ground, he takes his axe handle and throws it on. He looks at it and he says, nothing like a nice piece of hickory. <laughs> and throws it on top of it. Nothing like, especially for us guys. I don't know about you girls, but there's nothing for us guys like this one guy who takes on insurmountable odds on his own, by his own strength and courage and ability, and defeats the bad guys. I could have picked some other ones. I mean, Chuck Norris comes to mind. Another action hero that faced insurmountable odds. And how did he do it? By his martial arts. And he could stand on his own without help and just defeat all foes. Maybe for you ladies, though, maybe it's something different. Maybe it's a, a woman who is able to overcome all obstacles by her resolute, unfearful, courageous way of living. Either way, we prize people that can stand there and overcome insurmountable odds on their own. And we kind of want to be like that. I want to be like that. I have a problem asking for help sometimes, and I think a lot of you are the same way. We want to do it on our own, and we want to be our own savior, and we want to take care of all things. Well, thank God we don't live in a world like in the movies. Most of us don't have to worry when we set out some place of being set upon by men with axe handles. There are certain places we might go you want to be watching out. But generally, we don't have to live in that kind of fear of being harassed, especially in the daytime. And thank God for that. But the same is not true when it comes to our spiritual health and welfare. Our life in Christ is one of being a spiritual warfare. And it's not just sometimes. It's every single day. Every single hour. You are battling. And I'm battling. 
And if we think we can be a Clint Eastwood or a Chuck Norris and stand on our own, you are very mistaken. And if that doesn't change, you're more than likely going to take a fall. Why is that? It's because, first of all, what Jesus tells us about sin. Sin is inherent in me. I can't get rid of it. I can't help but have sinful thoughts, words, and actions. It's just the way I am. I would love to be able to go through a day and not have a single bad thought, not say a single bad thing. I might be able to control what my hands do and what my mouth does, but my thoughts, I don't know of a single person except the one that can control those. This is what Jesus is talking about in our gospel reading. It comes out of us. That's what defiles us. That's what makes us sinful. It's in our heart. It's our evil thoughts, the sexual immorality, the theft, the murder, adultery. All of these things come from a heart that wants to do what I want to do, which often stands against you want to, what you want to do, and always, always stands against what God's will is for me. If I want to do it on my own, it's not God's will. God wants us to be other-centered, and I can't help but be centered on myself. going to sin. I can't help it, and I can't control it, and neither can you. So we're right for spiritual warfare. We can't protect ourselves from it. Paul gives us this warning from the Lord. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're not wrestling against people. You can work out, you can arm yourselves with a weapon. It's not going to help in spiritual warfare because even if it's a person that's standing in front of you and making you angry, it's not really them. It's a force behind them, and that force is Satan and his demonic horde. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan doesn't make us sin per se, but he knows what your weak spots are. And he certainly will hit those. He can arrange for things and temptations to come into your life that will attack you, and he'll do it when you're down, when you're weak, when you're mourning, when you're angry. He has no mercy. He'll kick you when you're down and keep on kicking you. But the reason he sin is what's inside of me. He knows how to stir that up, and I can't help but respond because I have a sinful, disobedient will. What he does most strongly is he whisper lies into your ear. Once you have succumbed to sin, and all of us, we know we're going to do that, he's got some lies that he tells you. And maybe there's more than this in your life, but I've picked a couple of them. The first one is, your sin is not a big deal. Yeah, you gossip. So, everybody gossips. And it's not as bad as that guy over there or that woman that committed adultery. It's not as bad as that guy that beat his wife. It's not as bad as this one who left his spouse and his kids. It's just gossip. It's not that bad. It's no big deal. And, hey, didn't Jesus tell you you're forgiven? Well, my goodness, why are you sweating it? Doesn't Jesus want you to be happy above all things? You ever heard those words, any of them? Our sinful heart wants to hear them. And the problem with them is, is our sins forgiven? Yes. We're forgiven for all of them. But the problem comes when sin gets to be no big deal. If sin isn't a big deal, why do we need a Savior? And if you don't need a Savior, you don't have forgiveness. You don't have salvation. And that's the slippery slope that goes down into unbelief. That's one lie that he likes to whisper in our ears. 
The other one is when we're convicted of our sin, when we know we've done wrong and we're feeling just terrible about it, his lie is, yeah, and you know what? Let me tell you, you can't be forgiven. You committed that sin last week and the week before and the week before, and I heard you. You promised you wouldn't do it, and there you are doing it again. Do you think, do you think the Lord's going to forgive you? That person that you sinned against, they're not forgiving you. What makes you think that the Lord will forgive you? When you're down and you're despairing over your sin, those words are awful to hear. And they can hit right home in your heart. And they can have to make two kinds of responses in us. One is despair that's so deep you just give up. The other, and I experienced this, is, well, if I'm a sinner, I can't control it. I don't care. Might as well just go and have fun. Party like it's 1999. Have fun now, because there'll come a day when I can't. Both of those lies are aimed at us to get us to separate ourselves from our Lord and Savior, who has done everything to forgive us. Thankfully, Jesus has an answer to the spiritual warfare. And Paul gives it to us in verses 10 and 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the evil schemes of the devil. Be strong, but not in your own strength. You don't have strength on your own. You have a weakened, sinful heart that will lead you astray. You need a strength that comes from outside yourself and that comes from Christ Jesus. Put on the armor of God. Not an armor that you create. Not one that you buy. You know whose armor it is? It's Jesus' armor. It's the armor he wore when he walked this earth. It's spiritual. And it's the way he was able to defeat the devil. And the greatest example of his defeating the devil was 40 days in the wilderness. Physically weakened, he rebutted every single temptation that the devil threw at him. He conquered it. And not just that. Throughout his entire ministry, his entire ministry consisted of him saying no to sin, no to evil human will, and yes to God, even though it meant that he had led to a cross. Passive obedience, but not just passive obedience, he was active. When he left the desert after those 40 days of temptation, he took it to the devil. And he took it through his words, his preaching of the coming of the kingdom of God, which is the reign and rule. He brought that, breaking into the devil's kingdom of sinfulness and saying, this person belongs to me by faith. You can't have this person anymore. He belongs to me by faith. This person belongs to me by faith. Taking it to the devil, attacking him, and taking what he wanted most, which is our souls. Every single person that had a demon, Jesus cast them out. They could not refuse him because he rules over them. He is stronger than them. They must obey his word. He lived a totally righteous life in right standing before God. But the place where we see his greatest victory is on the cross. There he defeated in your life and in my life sin forever, the devil and all of his ways forever, our sentence of eternal death and separation from God, and in his resurrection gives to us eternal life. Your atoning sacrifice. Your reason that your sins are forgiven. Because when God looks at you, he doesn't see them anymore. They were washed to the cross and they're gone. Even the sins that I've committed today and I'll commit tomorrow, they continue to be washed to the cross. And I know that every time I confess them, that's his answer. He gives that to you. The spiritual armor he gave to you in baptism, when the Holy Spirit came into your heart and your life, he put that armor on you. All of the things and the ways that Jesus did for you, he put that on you, and by faith, you carry that with you every single day.
Paul talks about them. Talks about the belt of truth. And what is that truth? The truth is who Jesus is for you. Your Lord and Savior, true God and true man, but not just that, who you are to Jesus. Who you are to God because of everything that he's given you. You're his precious and beloved child. Much loved even though you continue to sin. Feet protected by the gospel. What is that gospel? That Christ has done all so that you can withstand the attacks of the devil. You stand on the gospel promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The shield of faith. There was a Roman shield. Which, by the way, where did Paul get this, get this imagery? Well, Paul says that he's incarcerated, that he's under house arrest in Rome. That meant that he had some freedom, but he's got a Roman soldier that's standing there watching over him, and he's looking at that guy's armor, and he's saying, yeah, that's armor for a physical battle, but from Jesus I have spiritual armor, and this is it. The shield of faith. See how long it is? A shield that could protect most of a soldier's body? That's what faith is for you. Because the devil is always aiming those poison arrows, those flaming darts. And what are those? Those are all the accusations. of you sinned? Can you be forgiven? Does it really matter? Should you really be concerned about it? All of those things that he whispers at you, faith says, yes, those matter. Yes, God hates them. But yes, God loves me and has forgiven me. And no longer accuses me of these sins because Christ became my sin and took it on the cross. So devil, all your accusations, take them and you can go straight to hell because I'm with Jesus now and forever in eternal life. That's the helmet of salvation that I wear. I know the promises of scripture. I know what Christ has said and it's for me. They're mine by the Holy Spirit. That's your armor. You're wearing it now. When you choose to disobey and follow your own will, it's almost like we start to take it off. But the Holy Spirit is always there to point out those ways not to draw you down so deep that you're in despair and never return, but so that you'll look to your Savior, look to all that he's done on the cross and the tomb and in the resurrection and hold fast to that by faith. And stand. You don't have to go out and fight. Christ fought for you. The victory is won. Stand in that victory. Stand in all of these gifts that he's given you. Stand in his right standing given to you. And you know what? Sometimes we succumb to the devil's temptations in our own sinful hearts, and we fall, and who's there to pick us up but the Holy Spirit to reach down through that gospel message, through confession and absolution, keeping us in repentant faith before Christ and standing us again and saying, stand, be courageous because I've taken care of it all. You're safe in your faith with me and the Holy Spirit that lives in your heart. You don't stand alone. You stand together with the Holy Spirit, always with you, watching over you, keeping you in repentant faith through all his work. And not alone, just you and the Holy Spirit. We stand together as his church. That's why we gather together. That's why we confess our sins corporately so we can hear, hey, we're all in the same boat. It's not just me. But then the same words of absolution come upon your heart and your mind. You are forgiven in Christ completely without anything that you've done, and he did it all for you. We worship together. We have fellowship together. We come alongside one another with open ears to listen, to listen when others are hurt, when they're in pain, when they're grieving, when they're worried, when they're upset, when they're mourning. All those times when they're weak and the devil likes to attack, we're there to be Jesus to them, to speak words of comfort, to speak words of grace, to remind them that they too wear this armor from Christ and that he is there watching over them. 
And as Paul mentions at the end of his letter, to pray. Pray for one another. Certainly on your own, pray for those that you know are coming up on a hard time and struggling. But pray with a person if they'll let you. Be it over the phone or in person. If they'll let you put your hand on theirs, it's a very powerful thing. It doesn't have to be a perfect prayer. But just pray that the Lord would come alongside them and help them. And that they would know that they are baptized children of God. Loved much by him and cared for by him in all things. That Jesus is with them and will never let them go. Be strong. Not in your own strength, in Christ's strength. And stand. Stand knowing that he fights for you and he fights with you every single day. And when you fall, he picks you up. It's one thing to be a Clint Eastwood or a Chuck Norris. And maybe we need those kind of guys in the real world. But generally, you're not alone. Evil in the, in the real world is defeated by more than just one person. In your spiritual struggles, it's not you alone. It's the Holy Spirit bringing Christ into your life. He stands with you. He fought for you. The victory is won, and he keeps you safe in that victory. Now, throughout your time in this world, throughout all the spiritual struggles, all the way unto life everlasting. May that be your assurance and your faith and mine as well.